Deuteronomy chapter 2, as we continue in our Bible study in this precious book, we have yet so much to discover. Deuteronomy chapter 2. As you turn there, we're going to pray in a moment and ask God to help us. We know that VBS just ended today, correct? Who helped out with VBS this week at any capacity? Don't be shy. Lift it up. Some may be more shy because they were dancing and it was caught on tape and stuff, but that's okay. Service unto the Lord. Hands up, please. We need to see your hands. Can we just give a hand for everybody that helped out on VBS this week? People worked during the day and came right here to help with children from 3 to 13 years old, and we're so grateful because Jesus loves kids, and that's a reflection through this ministry, so we thank you for being an extension of Jesus' love through this church to the people that came. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the obvious sense of your presence in this place, and Lord, we ask that the spirit of wisdom and revelation would rest on this word, that you would open our eyes and our hearts Lord, we echo what the psalmist said. Let your light and truth lead me to your dwelling place, to your holy hill, that I may come to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. Lord, our prayer is that your light, your truth, would lead us into your presence. And not just your presence, it would lead us to the altar where we can lay down our lives again as a living sacrifice because God, you are our joy. Not what you give us, not what you do for us, just you. Speak to us through this word. Energize your people who have served you all week. Energize your people who have worked all week. Energize your people who have been battling all week. Feed our souls, we pray. We look to you in Jesus' name, amen. The Israelites coming out of Egypt is a picture of the believer coming out of the world in salvation. The Israelites going into the promised land is a picture in some context of, yes, getting to heaven, but more practically of you and I being planted in the center of God's will, enjoying all the spiritual blessings that he has purchased for you and me coming out of Egypt. As believers, we can come out of Egypt, but not every believer can experience what God has in the promised land. As a believer, we can be like the first generation that came out of Egypt and die in the wilderness and miss out on everything that God has for us. Or as believers, we can be like the second generation, and come to the place in which we truly walk with God into what he has for our lives. Up to this point, we've dealt with chapter 1. Moses is standing before a fresh new breed of Israelites who are right at the threshold of the Jordan River, ready to see it come to pass, all that they've heard, to step into the promised land. Before that, though... Moses felt on his heart by the Spirit to preach a sermon as we see in the book of Deuteronomy. And he is now going to inspire this new generation not just to get into the promised land, but to inhabit and stay in the promised land. And so what does he do? At this point, he's looking back to the past and he's taking principles from the past and making them inspirations for the future. And in chapter 1, Moses deals with the first two years of the wilderness journey for the Israelites. When their moms and dads were still alive and when they were still under the age of 20. Chapter 1 deals with them coming out of Egypt all the way to Kadesh Barnea, which is pretty much the border of the land of Canaan, where everything went sour because they disobeyed God and they were turned back to the Red Sea to just wander and wander and wander for 38 years. So Moses gives principles for these people in that two-year period. Now in chapter 2, Moses is going to take principles out of the near end of that 38-year period and a little bit after. Moses is now going to give them principles right after the first generation is going to die. 
So this would have been really fresh for this new generation because they were in their adult years. And this is what we need to keep in mind here. He wants to inspire them. He wants to remind them of certain things, key events in that 38-year period. We already dealt with the first two. Now this 38-year period, he's going to take key events to stir their hearts, to believe God for the promised land. So we read in verse 1 of chapter 2. Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. Why? Because they disobeyed. So they came to the place of the border, and then they disobeyed. So he says, turn back. You turn, you're going back to the Red Sea, and you're going to wander for years and years and years. As the Lord told me, and for many days we traveled around Mount Seir, then the Lord said to me, you have been traveling around this mountain country long enough. Turn northward. This is what we're about to see in this portion of the book of Deuteronomy. Moses, by the Spirit, is going to recount three incidences with the people of Israel that they had with three different people groups. He's going to remind them of three different people groups that they bumped into, and he's going to take principles out of that. The first group of people are who? Who read Deuteronomy 2? Say it if you know it. The group of people that they were first to encounter was who? The Edomites. Secondly, who? The Moabites. Thirdly, who? The Ammonites. Now, they have already encountered these people. They've actually passed through these people, so to speak, to get to where they are at this moment. Now, what we're about to hear is what Moses wants, not just for them to hear, but what we need to hear. And each of these sections, how they met with the Edomites, how they met with the Moabites, how they met with the Ammonites, have their own unique insights to stir their hearts. But there is an underlining thread that connects all of them that Moses wants to declare as an overlying theme for this fresh breed of Israelites to hear. So what do we see? Look at verse 5. Who has Deuteronomy 2 open? Read verse 5 if you want to, please, nice and loud with your preacher voice. Verse 5, another person to get ready to speak from verse 9, and another person to speak from verse 19. So Tamara, verse 5, please. Do not meddle with them, for I will not give you any of their land, no, not not so much as one for the because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. Did you hear that? He's telling him, don't meddle with them, don't contend with them, don't... Don't fight them because I've given Mount Seir as a possession to Esau. Verse 9. Who has it? Don't be shy. And the Lord said to you, Do not harass Moab or contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land for possession, because I have given Ar to the people of Lot for possession. I have given Ar to Lot for a possession. Verse 19. Whoever wants to read it, please. And when you approach the territory of the people of Ammon, do not harass them or contend with them, for I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the sons of Lot for a possession. I have given this land of the Ammonites to Lot for a possession. What do you think the people were inspired to hear by Moses repeating this truth for these different people groups. It goes beyond Israel not taking what does not belong to them. That is partly true, yes, but there is a greater theme for their faith. And what is that? Say that again, sorry. Is it that God keeps his promises? God keeps his promises and even more specific than that. That is true. That principle is obviously true. Here's the principle. That if God displaced people for Edom... If God moved other people groups for Moab and for the Ammonites and planted them in their respective lands, how much more will he do it for you, Israel? How much more will he do it for you if he's done it for them that are not in direct covenant with him? How much more will he do it for you as his children, as his followers, as his faithful people? What they're hearing is, oh, you're telling me that Edom is there because, Lord, you brought them to that place and gave them a possession? Lord, you did that for Moab, you did it for the Ammonites? And what he's trying to say is, if I've done it for them, I will do it for you. Have faith. What you see, what you hear, I'm in control of all of it. Surely I'm going to be in control of your life. And this is what they needed to hear because they're about to face a land that seems impossible to conquer. And what God's trying to say is this. Whatever you pray for, Whatever you believe God for, whatever you're standing before and you think it's almost near impossible to receive or experience, notice this, that God has done it before 
and he's able to do it again. And if God has done it for others, he's able to do it for you and me. And so they were getting an illustrative sermon to see, okay, we get it. It's possible. Guess what, brothers and sisters, nothing challenges God. Nothing is too difficult for God. He's done things before. He's able to do it again. And even if it's never been done before, God can speak things into existence with the breath of his mouth. This is the God that you and I serve. And this is the God that they needed to hear and understand for their specific context. But now we want to draw lessons from each of these groups. Lessons from Edom. Lessons from Moab. Lessons from Ammon. They were to pass through these different places that these nations possessed. And there was instructions and there was demands for each of these places they were to pass. There's very, many similar things. But each of them have a unique insight. Look here in verse 3 down. He says, you travel long enough, verse 4, and command the people, you are about to pass through the territory of your brothers, the people of Esau, who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. So be very careful. Do not contend with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as the sole of the foot to tread on, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. You shall purchase food from them with money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water from them with money that you may drink. Then he goes on until verse 8. But this is the interesting thing. Not that what Moses says about the Edomites and how the Israelites encountered them. It's what he doesn't say. It's what Moses chooses not to say when retelling the story that these very same people experience as grown adults. What did he not say? Well, we have to find out from the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 20. And this is the actual incident that was lived out. And look what Moses records in Numbers that he doesn't say in his sermon in the book of Deuteronomy. Numbers 20, verse 18. So the people, this is when they actually did it. They walked up to Edom, and they wanted to pass through. And look how Edom responds to Israel in verse 18. But Edom said to him, you shall not pass through, lest I come out with the sword against you. And the people of Israel said to him, Listen, we will go up by the highway, and if we drink of your water, I and my life, livestock, I'll pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. But he said, you shall not pass through. And Edom came out against them with a large army and with a strong force. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory, so Israel turned away from him. Compare this. Now look back at Deuteronomy 2, verse 8. Look how Moses retells the story. So we went on away from our brothers, the people of Esau, who lived in Seir, away from their Reba, wrote to Elath and Ezion Geber. A lot of details missing. A lot of details missing. Uh, it seems like important details are missing from Moses retelling the story. Well, here's a question. Why did Edom react in such a way against Jacob, against Israel? So partly is what we read here. They must have maybe been afraid that if they really come in, you're talking about millions of people, they're going to ruin our vineyards, they might take over, this might be a, just, this might be a trick. Maybe they're deceiving us. Why would Israel deceive Edom? You hear? Do you see? So some would say they're afraid. But I believe it goes deeper than that. Who are the Edomites, by the way? This is important to understand how this makes sense. Who are the Edomites? Esau. Descendants of who? Esau. Who's Esau? Brother of who? Jacob. Who's Jacob? Israel. I believe the reason why Edom reacted this way is because they harbored bitterness in their hearts against Israel, who is Jacob, for how Jacob dealt with Esau when they were living together. You say, how can you come to that conclusion? It's only later when you come to the book of Obadiah, a small book of the Old Testament. And it's all about how Edom, down the road, rejoiced greatly when Jerusalem was taken captive by the Babylonians. They rejoiced. They loved it. Now tell me, who would love such a thing unless you actually hated somebody in your heart? And so when Edom was there and they came and they said, hey, let us go through, they said, mm-mm. Not so. We know who you are. We know where you come from. We want nothing to do with you. And so they came out ready to fight them. 
ready to go to war, and the Bible highlights that they're brothers, they're brothers, they're brothers. And so when Moses retells the story, guess what he chooses not to do? He chooses not to do what Edom did, and that's hold a record of wrong. Edom held a record of wrong against Jacob, Israel, for years. And in fact, it was passed down from generation to generation all the way to the book of Obadiah. And when Moses retells the story for this new breed, this new generation, he does not bring up the record of wrong that Edom did to Jacob in Numbers chapter 20. He strategically veiled that incident lest their hearts be provoked to harbor hatred and bitterness towards their own brothers. What wisdom. And he moves on from there. But he says something else in verse 7. Look at verse 7. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These 40 years the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. Think about this. So he's saying, you went to Edom and it didn't work out, but... Remember this, that God has been with you throughout that whole time. And here you have, what? Israel extending their heart to their brothers, wanting to work with them in partnership so that they can get to where God wants them to get to. And Esau cuts off any chance of that happening. And you know what God wants to remind Israel? Listen, even if you extend your hand in fellowship, even if you want to be a person of peace, and the person that you're trying to reconcile with or trying to build a relationship with or trying to move forward with does not want that, as painful as it is, it could be as close as someone as your brother. I'm with you. They might not help you. They might not provide for you. They might not guide you. I'll do it. I fill the void of even the closest relationship that you think you can have with another. He says, these 40 years, I have been with you. And even relationships might fail, they might not work out, they might not be reconciled, but I am walking with you. And so they didn't give you food and water, even if you were willing to pay for it, but I gave you manna every day. And I gave you water from the rock that followed you every day. But think about this. When I read this, it blew my mind. You know why? Because he says, I've been with you these 40 years and you have lacked nothing. But the first generation is still alive at this point. So you have the first generation still alive at this point that rebelled against God, disobeyed God, did not believe God. And still in this context, God says, even with you rebellious people, I was with you. I walked with you. I provided for you. That tells me something. God is our father, yes? And he disciplines his children, but he doesn't forsake us. Even when he chooses to discipline us, it is always to train us. It is always for our good. It doesn't feel good. I promise you, it will never feel good. But this is the assurance that we have, that he had for the Israelites. It's the same for us. That even when we have maybe even forfeited something wonderful because of our continuous rebellion, God is still for us. And he's still with us. That's a precious truth. Him saying you're going to wander in the wilderness did not mean you're never going to hear from me, see from me again. You're done. It's over. It's you forfeited this blessing, but I'm still going to walk with you as a dad, as a father. If that doesn't make your heart rejoice, I don't know what else will. But then we read something very interesting in verse 14 and 15 of chapter 2. This is now when he talks about Moab, and we're getting lessons from Moab. Very similar instructions. If you're going to pass by, don't go to war with them. Don't contend with them. Buy water, buy food, pass through, don't touch anything. But then look at verse 14 and 15 here of chapter 2. And the time from our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook Zered was 38 years until the entire generation, that is the men of war, had perished from the camp as the Lord has sworn to them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from the camp until they had perished. Oh, wait a minute. Just read in verse 7 that he was with them. We just read in verse 7 that he would never forsake them, that he had given them everything, that they would lack nothing. Then you read on, your heart is all inspired and fresh with faith. Verse 14 tells us, yeah, he destroyed them. He was against them. He wanted them to all perish. 
How do we make sense of this? Again, it goes back to that one point. It's his discipline. It's the forfeiting of the blessing that is spoken of here. It's not his heart towards them as his people. It's not his posture and his affection towards them as his children. It's speaking about what they, because of their own choice, have let go of and have let die in the wilderness. See the balance of understanding the nature of God? Yes, we understand that even in my disobedience and even when I turn from God, He still loves me, He still with me, He still provides for me, He still for me. But at the same time, that same God, because of His holiness and His justice, will not compromise His standards. And we'll let things die in our lives because of our choices. So we walk in this beautiful balance of understanding the love of God and the holiness of God. And we ask God for the wisdom to know how to understand him in those ways. So we learn something from Moab, but then we come down to verse 21 and 22 and we have something from Ammon. They went from Edom. Edom said, no way, you're not coming by. They go to Moab. And at that point, the entire first generation is dead. It's done. They've reached their expiration time. Now it's left to the second generation, and they're going from Moab to Ammon. And look at what we see here. Verse 21 says, A people great and many, and tall as the Anakim, but the Lord destroyed them before the Ammonites, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place, as he did for the people of Esau, who live in Seir, when he destroyed the Horites before them and dispossessed them and settled in their place even to this day. So what Moses is doing here, don't get lost here, what Moses is doing here when they are talking about coming to the Ammonites, he's giving a history lesson. Again, he is telling them, you want to know how the Ammonites got here, Israelites? You want to know how even Edom got to where they were? He's rehearsing this again. He's saying, the Lord dispossessed them. The Lord destroyed the people that possessed these lands beforehand. That's how Edom got there. That's how Ammon got here. And so again, they're being showered by this truth. Yet God is the one that's in control of all of this. And if God did it for them, he will do it for me. But it even goes higher than that. This is the principle that we can get from this text. God is sovereign over all the affairs of this world. No matter what king is out there, no matter what country empires are ruling, no matter how independent or no matter how much they flex their muscle and power, no matter what they take over, no matter what they lose, know this, God is the master chess player moving all the pieces. That's what they're hearing here. So the Horites are gone, the Ammonites move in, and uh, these guys are gone, and the Edomites come in, and we're thinking, oh, wow, look, look at what the world is coming to. Look at all this movement. And God is the one that's orchestrating all of it. And that should comfort us to know that there is a God in heaven who has all the right to intervene in the affairs of this world. You and I do not believe in a God that set the world in motion and kicked his feet back and is watching something else. He is fully involved in not just your life personally, but in the government of this nation, the governments of the world, the kings and their decisions. All of that God is fully involved in. And so then you read verses like Psalms chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, which makes sense in light of them hearing this truth, what David says. What does he say? It's a famous scripture. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. So if God is the one who's ultimately in charge of even how these empires and these people groups and these communities at large levels are placed and dispossessed, he goes, why don't you do the best thing you can do for yourself, rulers? Partner with this God. Put your hand in his hand. Kiss the son. And then you read on later on in Psalms 33 verse 12, a precious truth for not just the nation of Israel that this is referring to, but for any nation. Psalms 33 verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. You and I must be fully aware of this. Though we are a democracy and though there are different forms of government, there is one truth that is available for any nation. If you choose to make God the God of that nation, you're in for a blessing. And if you choose to rebel against this God, you are at his disposal. He can flick you off the scene whenever he pleases. This is what they're hearing. 
And this should stir their hearts because guess what? Israel was in partnership with God. And they knew, oh, we have him. And one with God, as Martin Luther said, is the majority. One with God is majority. You can have the whole world against God. And if you're one person with God, you're the majority. And you're in favor. And then we read on. At this point now, he, he's finished speaking about these three different people groups and how they encountered them. And now Moses is transitioning to talk about two different encounters. And these encounters were with two different kings. And these kings are the ones that they conquered because of God's gracious hand. And again, now they're hearing, oh yeah, we conquered kings. We conquered kings. So when we go into this land with all these giants, we've seen it done before. We're going to see it happen again. And so he retells these stories, and these two kings are named Sion and Og. And so that's what we see here in verse 26. Let's read. So I sent messengers from the wilderness of Kedemoth to Sion, the king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, Let me pass through your land. I will go only by the road. I will turn aside neither to the right nor to the left. You shall sell me food for money. Hold on that I may eat and give me water for money that I may drink. Only let me pass through on foot. As the sons of Esau who live in Seir and the Moabites who live in Ar did for me. Until I go over the Jordan into the land that the Lord our God is giving to us. What pops out to you there? And Moses retelling the story of how he sent messengers to King Sion, convincing him through terms of peace to be able to travel through. What sticks out from those verses? Does this seem like Moses being accurate in this? It seems like there's a false sort of... Did you guys catch that? Does it seem like Moses is being very accurate in saying that, hey, King Sion, won't you let us through the same way that Edom and Moab gave us food and let us pass through? Interesting, isn't it? Now, Moses, as the man of God he was, is not telling a lie to attempt to win and convince this king to have him pass by. He's not, he's not making a story up. He's not trying to twist something in order for them to be bought. That's not what he's doing here. Because what he's saying is not entirely inaccurate. What did he say here? You shall sell me food for money, verse 28, that I may eat and give me water for money that I may drink. So he's saying we paid for it. Now, what we read in Numbers 20, what we read even early on in this chapter is what? That they rejected them. That they walked away from them. That they did not let them pass through. But because of this verse, we can maybe believe that even though they went through the long way on the outskirts of the borders of these different communities, that some of these people took advantage of the business that was there and did sell food and water. And here's probably why the, that's true. In the same book, go to chapter 23 and look what Deuteronomy says in 23, verse 3 and 4. So we have the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites. And look what God says in verse 3 and 4 of Deuteronomy 23. In judgment to the Ammonite and the Moabites. No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever because, now look at this very carefully. This is why we have to read our Bibles very slowly. Because they did not meet you with bread and with water on the way when you came out of Egypt. There's a difference between not meeting you with bread and water and selling you bread and water. And the condemnation against Moab and Ammon was this, that when they came out as travelers, they were not hospitable or respectable enough to give them food because they were sojourners. They sold them food. They sold them water. So when Moses is saying, do this for us the same way that Moab and Edom sold us food and water, He's not necessarily telling a lie. The condemnation was they didn't have it in their hearts to give it to them. Does that make sense tonight? But maybe there's even a deeper principle than this. We figured out who the Edomites were, right? Descendants of who? Esau. Esau's who? Brother of who? 
Jacob. Jacob and Esau are who in relationship to Abraham? Grandsons, right? Grandsons. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Esau. Abraham's grandpa. Who are Moab and Ammon? They're related to Lot, according to Genesis 19, in a very detailed scenario that occurred after Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. What did Lot unfortunately have to experience because of his, his daughter's plan to apparently repopulate the earth because they thought that the whole world was destroyed? What happened? Both daughters intoxicated their father and slept with him to be impregnated in order to come to that solution. And let me read this in Genesis 19.36. Thus both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites to this day. So you have these two offsprings from Lot. But who's Lot in relation to Abraham? His nephew. What are we trying to say with all this? Edom, Moab, and the Ammonites are all relatives to Jacob. They're family. Some extended more than others. But they are related by blood to some degree. And there's a principle here. There is some kind of a principle here. In light of them having that familiar relationship. That maybe Moses is not declaring the failures of his own relatives to the outside world but is veiling that failure. It's a principle. That these, though they are failures, and though they are not walking with God directly, they veil, he veils the failures on their part to this king who is completely a pagan and has no relation to Abraham or the God of Israel. He veils those failures so that the outside world would not glean and rejoice in those failures. Now that might not be a principle to prove as the strongest in this text, but it is a principle throughout the Bible. Pay very close attention. As the people of God, as a spiritual family, guess what you and I will experience in this world? Unfortunately, from the highest level of leaderships to the common person in the congregant. Failure. Sin inconsistencies with their convictions. And the last thing that you and I want to do as the people of God is when a brother or sister or even a leader falls, that we declare their failures to an people that are not in covenant with God. This is Old Testament, New Testament truth. I remember something about First and Second Samuel on a personal level that's just... It's like watching a movie almost. It's so rich with insight, lived out practically, lived out with different situations. And when you come to the book of 2 Samuel, after Saul and Jonathan are killed, and David, now you read up to 2 Samuel, Saul was like a hunter's dog after this man. Saul was chasing this man relentlessly. Saul wanted to eat David alive with one gulp. He gets news that Saul was destroyed by an Amalekite, by the way, because Saul was supposed to kill all the Amalekites, and because Saul didn't kill all the Amalekites, the Amalekites killed Saul. It's a picture that when we don't kill all the sin in our life, eventually the sin will kill us. It will happen. What happens? David gets news. Somebody tells him that Saul has been slain. It's a failure. Saul died by suicide. Because of his failure in keeping his step with God as a man of God. Now look at what David says when he hears that Saul, the man that wanted to kill David. Look what he says in 2 Samuel verse 1, chapter 1 verse 17. And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and Jonathan his son. And he said it should be taught to the people of Judah. So this song that David's about to sing over Saul and Jonathan, he goes, listen, this is a part of my lament. I'm about to pour out my heart based on the grief of my friends here that died. My, my father-in-law, my friend that was closest to me than any person. He goes, I'm going to sing this song by the Spirit and I want you to teach it to all the people of Judah. Sounds like it's an important song. 
It sounds like the principles in this song are for the people of God. And look what he says here in verse 19. Your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Speaking of Saul and Jonathan, mainly Saul. Now look what he says. Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not on the streets of Ashkelon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exalt. Do you see what he's saying? Here you have a failure performed by a spiritual leader of a nation. And David says in this song that all the people are about to hear, shh, let's not project the failure of this man to a world that does not believe, lest we give them a greater reason not to believe. You say that's hypocrisy. No, we say that's wisdom. Why should the name of God be profaned? Why should people reject the gospel of grace from a perfect savior because of the inconsistencies of his people? I get a shiver down my spine when an article comes up or when some newscast declares a failure of a spiritual leader over church or a denomination. It should grieve all of us because now the world has a greater reason to mock. Now the world has another excuse not to give their hearts to Jesus Christ. And so the principle that Moses shows us with his relatives, the principle that we get from David, and even the principle that the Apostle Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul is dealing with a bunch of believers, and guess what they're doing? They're suing each other. They're going to court with one another. And Paul's like, I can't, I, he's like, listen, guys, don't you understand that some of you will actually judge angels in the new age? Don't you understand that you will sit and you will look at celestial beings and you will determine their fate? And you can't figure out some of your issues in the church? And his concern goes even deeper than that. He goes, hold up, let me read this. 1 Corinthians 6, 4 to 6. So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers, but brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers? You're exposing your failures to the world. You're showcasing how you can't even have fellowship when we're declaring to the world that we are a people of peace. And so you and I, must, as, as you walk with Jesus, God forbid, you will experience failure in terms of other people before you. Learn this principle, please. Learn it now. You don't have to tell everybody everything. Know this. Know this. There will be some things that you will see and hear in life that you should keep to yourself even until your grave for the best of those outside. Now, within the church, there's disciplinary processes. There's things that we have to do within the church to maintain holiness and to maintain integrity. That's true. But the outside world does not need to be exposed to our inner failures so that we can win them and not lose them. Jesus Christ does not need to have his name tarnished because we are inconsistent in our holiness. So we come back to Deuteronomy chapter 2. And we look down in verse 30. And what does it say in verse 30? But Sion the king of Heshbon would not let us pass by him. It didn't work for him. He wasn't convinced. For the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might give him into your hand. So now we have the reason why. So Moses sends messengers and says, can we come by like they let us go by? And Sion says, I'm not having it. You're not coming through. In fact, I actually want to go to war with you. And we go, why would Sion do such a thing? And we come to verse 30 and you realize that it was God that hardened his spirit to make his heart, heart a rock so that he would not let them pass by. We read that and we go, not fair. Why would God do such a thing? Is God so set on destroying this person even when an extension of peace has been brought out that he had no choice but to say no? This is why we have to read all of the Bible and not just choose verses and come to a conclusion 
that can lead us to a different understanding of how God deals with the human heart. So up to this point, it looks like a waste of time. Why send messengers of peace and say, hey, uh, he, he, you want to do this? And he goes, no, God hardened my heart. It's not going to happen. Sion had a choice, and the choice that he went with got sealed, and he went from there. Just like with Pharaoh. Here's proof for that if you want proof. Go to Deuteronomy 20. Deuteronomy 20, verse 10. In the same book. Look how God gives instructions to the people on how to deal with enemies. He says, when you draw near to a city to fight against it, offer terms of peace to it. Like what they just did. Offer terms of peace to it. And if it responds to you peaceably and it opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. So what we get from that verse is that when you give an extension of peace, it's a possibility for them to respond to that invitation to peace, including Sion. So God's not letting them go through all this ordeal and sending messengers and making this arrangement for peace for nothing. Sion, according to this verse, including all the other people that this nation would deal with, had a choice. Peace? Yes. Forced labor. All right. No peace? We're going to war. That's what this verse is talking about. This verse sheds light on this incident that Sion did, in fact, have a choice. And with the choice that he went with, God sealed his spirit and he drank from his own judgment. Look at Pharaoh and realize, again, from Exodus, that God predicted that Pharaoh would harden his heart. Pharaoh hardens his heart. You come to Exodus 9. And Exodus 9, after six plagues, did God say, then he hardened his heart. So God predicted it. People think that God hardened Pharaoh's heart from the beginning. No, he predicted that Pharaoh would harden his heart. Pharaoh does it, and God seals it to his judgment. Same with Sion. Sion had a choice. He refused that choice. God hardened his heart. He was judged. Sion is dealt with. There's victory. There's triumphant victory. But there's another king to deal with. His name is Og. And you read in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 3. What does it say? Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle Edre. But the Lord said to me, this is powerful, Do not fear him, for I have given him and all his people and his land into your hand, and you shall do to him as you did to Sion, the king of the Amorites. So now they come up to this other king, and he says, listen, because this king doesn't even wait for a peace treaty. So Moses is about to get these guys ready. Hey, go to Og, do the same thing. And as he's saying it, this is just imaginary, you know, as he's saying it, Og's already set up his arm, and he goes, you know what, never mind, we're just going to go to war. And God comes in to whisper into their hearts and say, I don't want you to be afraid of this king because the same thing that you did to Sion is the same thing that you're going to do to Og. Now, why is that inspirational for you and me? When you read about the guy's bed size, the Bible gives us a description of who this king was and how large he was in terms of frame. And you realize that perhaps the Bible is trying to indicate that Og was a lot more frightening, a lot more intimidating, a lot more empowering than Sion. Read about his bed size down here in verse 11. For only Og, the king of Bashan, was left of the remnant of the Rephaim. Behold, his bed was a bed of iron. That's scary enough. Your bed is made out of iron. Is it not in Rabbah of the Ammonites? Now, the bed apparently is put on display in some museum at the time. That's how terrifying it was. That, it, was like a, it was like a wonder. Nine cubits was its length and four cubits its breadth according to the common cubit. The common cubit, one cubit, was 18 inches. You do the math. Nine cubits by what? Four cubits. You translate that to feet, 13 and a half feet by six feet was his bed. Now to give you a visual for that, a basketball net from the floor to the rim is 10 feet. So his bed was 13 and a half feet by six feet. Now either that's indicating that he really needed a lot of room because he wiggled a lot, or he was a giant. I'll take the fact that he was a giant. And the fact that he was a giant, he's trying to say something in light of what we just read in verse 2. This is what he's trying to say. The guy was terrifying. He was huge. 
Maybe more intimidating to Sion. But look at this. No matter who your enemy is, whether it's Sion or Og, God can deal with them the same. And this is why it's more important. The Bible describes that our sins are at war with us. 1 Peter 2.11. That the passions of the flesh are at war against us. And you know why this is inspiring? Because some of us might have conquered Sion's. And we look at Og, and we compare Sion to Og, and we go, Og's a lot tougher than Sion. I've dealt with my anger issue, but here's my lust problem. It's been raining for years. I've tried to scare Og off. I've tried to yell at Og. Nothing's happening. It's still there. I've dealt with my pride issue. But here's my envy issue, and it doesn't seem to go away. And here's the word from this text for you and me, that whatever happened to Sion can also happen to Og. God is able to empower you to overcome not just some sin, but all sin. There is no partial victory in the Christian life. God wants to give us total victory over every enemy, over every sin. And that's what we get from this. No matter how big it looks, 13 and a half by 6 feet is the bed alone. Don't be scared. Because what you did to Sion, I have the power to give to you to deal with Og as well. We have to believe that though, the same way they had to believe that. No matter how hideous it is, no matter how much they've conquered in terms of other people, if you can believe God for the little things, believe God for the big things as well. God is able. Then we come to verse 12. To 21, and this is where we're closing. They dealt with Og. They dealt with Sion. And I'm going to tell you to turn to a part of your Bible that you've probably never been invited to turn to. The maps. If you have a map in your Bible, turn your Bible to the maps. I'm sure you and I have looked at that part before and say, what is this useful for? Well, you can record that on a Friday night in Deuteronomy chapter 2 and 3, you used a map. And if your maps go to the 12 tribes of Israel. Now you hold on to there. If you don't have a map, there's a, there it is up on the screen, okay? The 12 tribes of Israel. This is why we motivate people to have the book because it's easier to access these things. What is happening in Deuteronomy 12 to 21? Now that they've conquered, they've conquered Sion and they've conquered Og, the Bible now is about to describe to us what? How the land that Og and Sion possess were distributed to three different tribes. Or you can say two tribes and half a tribe. But let's just say three for simplicity. And, and it talks about Reuben. It talks about Gad. It talks about Manasseh possessing the land that these kings owned. Okay? Now, this is the visual here. So this whole time we're talking about Deuteronomy. And we're, we're, we're trying to figure out where they stood. This is the Jordan River right here. This is the promised land. This is where they were fighting. So they're they're coming here. We see Edom. We see Moab. We see Ammon, right? We've dealt with this. And they've come here, and they went to battle, as we heard, with these two kings. This is the question. Is this the promised land, or is this the promised land? Is this the part of the promised land? It's not. So why do we have three tribes parked there? So we have three tribes parked here. When actual, in actuality, these tribes were supposed to be a part of this group right here, and it was supposed to be divided amongst all of them. So when you and I read this and see this, this is what we have to visualize, that Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben did not cross the river Jordan. They stayed here. And when you read Deuteronomy, verses 12 to 21, you get the impression that it was God who gave that portion of land to them. It was God who has extended this part of the land to these tribes. And this is, again, another reason why we need to read all of the Bible. 
Was Manessa, Gad, and Reuben supposed to be here? Was that God's will? No, it wasn't. But God allowed them to because they so insisted upon it. This is a recap of what we did in Numbers 32. And I charge you, I praise God that we're coming back to these truths because it is so powerful when we grasp it. So you need to turn to Numbers 32, and this is where we're closing. Numbers 32, the book right before the book of Deuteronomy. Numbers 32. So this is after they went to war, right? This is after they went to war and they destroyed these kings. And they are now coming back. If we can put up that map, Sarah, if you don't mind. They are coming back. They are here, right? They're ready to go. But look at what two tribes asked of Moses in verse 4. They said, the land that the Lord struck down before the congregation of Israel. We just read that is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. And they said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants for a possession. Do not take us across the Jordan. So this was their motivation for not wanting to cross the Jordan. The reason why was because they looked around, and they go, hold on. We got a lot of livestock, and there's a lot of land. Why don't we ask Moses... If we can stay right here, and we don't want to cross the Jordan. Now, crossing the Jordan was God's promise to them that there is a land flowing with milk and honey. And this is what these tribes are saying. Maybe God doesn't know how tight it really is in there. We see this land, and it looks really good. There's plenty of space. There's plenty of food. This is wonderful. Let's stay right here. Here. Their motive for not crossing the Jordan is the motive for why a lot of people don't get into the center of God's will for their life. They're comfortable where they are and they think that what they can produce is better than what God has promised. I want you to know something tonight just in case you're exhausted. Hear this very carefully. There are a lot of Christians that are here and not here. There are a lot of Christians that are not convinced that God has something better across the Jordan. They think that, you know, I just want to stay close enough to the promise, but not too far from the world. And I want to park myself where I'm just in reaching distance to what God has for me, but I'm not too far from what the world can offer me as well. Now, what they're desiring is not necessarily sinful. This is, this is for their families. This is for their livestock. This is for their comfort. But listen, even our comfort, even our families, our plans, our future can sabotage, if we've idolized them, sabotage what God wants us to have. If we're not concerned about being in God's will, no matter what the cost, no matter where God wants to move our families, no matter what kind of sacrifice involves that, no matter what it demands on me, we can make something as good as what they're asking for into a problem and forfeiting God's promise. So this is where they were wrong. They didn't want to be in the center of God's will. They didn't trust God. They didn't trust his purpose. They wanted to be somewhat connected to God's people but not fully connected to God's people. This is hear this very carefully because there might be some people tonight that are close but not fully in now it may seem innocent it may seem harmless right i mean what's so we, we took care of the enemies there's nothing around us we're just minutes away we'll just hop in the car and we'll come on down They did not realize the depths of the consequences of this simple act of saying, we want to be here, but not fully in. Here's four of them. Number one, they distanced themselves from the presence of God. God's desire was that they would be here for the sole purpose that God's dwelling would be with them. Now, they were so, as close as they were, they were distant enough that when we read in the book of Joshua, what happens? They build an altar somewhere here. Now, God said there's only one altar in one temple. It's going to be here. You build it here. But they build this altar so that in future generations, 
when their kids grow up and they die off, these people wouldn't think that these people were of the world, but that they're actually connected. They wouldn't get confused. They would come across maybe and see the altar and they would say, oh, you guys are in covenant with us. It's a scary thing when you confuse people whether you're a Christian or not. If a person cannot live with you for a week and not tell that there's something different between you and their worldly friends, that's a problem. That's a problem. If there's nothing that differentiates us, that's an issue. And that's what they were trying to do. They knew it. They knew it so that they had to set up this altar so that they would not be convinced otherwise. And it almost caused a civil war. It almost caused a civil war between this, this whole group here and this group here. They freaked out. They're saying, listen, we're not trying to create our own altar here. We're trying to mirror your altar so that we don't have a problem in the future. Secondly, they were a closer threat to their enemies. When there was invasions and when there was warfare, guess who's going to get hit first? Think from this side or this side? This side. And you read in scripture later on that when the Assyrians came and that warfare broke out, these were the tribes that were affected first. If you don't want to be full in for God, guess what you expose yourself to? The influences of the devil and the world. Guaranteed. Just like them, they have exposed themselves enough to the world, to the enemy, that when the enemy would come in, they're going to get hit first. There's so much to say, but we're not going to go into it. Thirdly, obviously, they're missing out on God's best. See, this is how they reasoned to stay where they wanted to stay. They saw that the land was good for livestock. And they failed to believe that God had something better across the river. When you live by your senses and not by faith, you rob yourself from God's best. How many professing Christians are doing the same? It's how I feel. This makes me feel good. This, this makes me feel pleasure. This makes me live by your feelings for the rest of your life. And as much as you'll feel good, you are robbing yourself from the best thing that God can give you. That will surpass anything that you can feel or make happen in your life, guaranteed. The most miserable person in the world is the lukewarm Christian. Because you have enough of the world where you don't have God. And you have enough of God where you don't have the world. Just pick a side. Pick a side and just enjoy yourself. Stop confusing people. Stop making people wonder if you're a part of a covenant with Christ. And just pick a side and splurge yourself. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. Lastly, the choices that these guys made, whether they wanted to believe it or not, affected others in their own growth and in their own faith. Mm, 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 mm. We always think that our decisions don't harm anybody else. Our choices, our standards of spirituality only affect me. They won't affect anybody else. Now, when you read in Numbers 32, you realize something. Look at verse 1 again, of Numbers 32. Now, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad had a very great number of livestock, now they talk to Moses, and you come to verse 6, and guess what? Moses isn't very happy. Moses said to the people of Gad and to the people of Reuben, Shall your brothers go to war while you sit here? Why will you discourage the heart of the people of Israel from going over into the land that the Lord has given them? Your fathers did this when I sent them from Kadesh Bernia to see the land. For when they went up to the valley of Eshkol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the people of Israel. Isn't it amazing that their lack of involvement would have affected their desire to involve themselves? And then you read on, you read on, you read on. And then you come to verse 33. And again, it demands us to pay close attention to the text. And look what it says. Look what it says. And Moses gave to them the people of God. Okay, that's what we read in verse 1. 
and the people of Reuben, makes sense, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. I didn't read about Manasseh in the first few verses. All of a sudden, as I'm reading, I come to verse 33, and Manasseh's involved. How can that be? This is why. Because as Moses is going back and forth with Reuben and Gad, Manasseh is looking at the land too. And he's thinking about the land that God promised. And he goes, I'm going to go with those guys. And he joins with Reuben and Gad. Reuben and Gad, whether they wanted to believe it or not, influenced Manasseh to not grow for himself and to not lay hold of the fullness of God for his own life. You better believe that the choices you make in terms of how you want to live your Christian life will affect one Christian at least. And if it won't have them be convinced to plant themselves over here, it could discourage them, like what Moses said, to go full out for what God wanted for all of them. And we might think to ourselves, well, what's the big deal? I mean, it's, it's their choice. But here's the big deal. You and I wouldn't say the same thing about our bodies, would we? Is the church not the body of Christ? Would anybody here, maybe we would, but let's say your, your right hand stops working. Would anybody in here be rejoiceful that the fact that all of the rest of our bodies, though this isn't working, the rest of our bodies are functioning, so that's fine. Now, you wouldn't be rejoiceful if you knew that you could do something about this. If you couldn't do anything about this, you would be rejoiceful. I give thanks to God that though this isn't functioning, he hasn't answered my prayer, I'm still living. But let's say you had a choice to do something with this hand, and you didn't, because you're happy that the rest of the body was functioning. You wouldn't say that. If you could do something about this paralyzed hand, you would do something with this paralyzed hand. And if your hand, let's say, in the body of Christ, if you're paralyzed in your spirituality and you think that you're just affecting yourself, realize that you're affecting the rest of the body. It's God's will for all of us to be functioning. It's God's will for all of us to be intact. It's God's will for us to be living in full health with our souls and with our spirits. If you think that you're just affecting yourself and you're making your own choices, if you're connected to the body, if you're connected to a local church, you're affecting the rest of the body. And it would function differently if you just came to life. The entire experience of the body would be a different experience if you would just make the choice I'm going to allow the Spirit of God to animate me again so that I can make all of this a greater experience and joy and effect. So what happens here? He's influenced, and this is where we're closing, promise. The question that we ask ourselves from the end of Deuteronomy 2 and 3 here, we're going to touch on the rest of 3 next week that what could have been a unified, joyful experience was unfortunately not going to be so. This is where we're closing. If it was God's will for all the tribes to go into the promised land, do you not think that it's God's will for all of us to be in the fullness of his will? All of us. Not some of us. All of us. That's the question. So this is how we're going to end this Bible study with a simple, simple question. At this portion of the book of Deuteronomy, you know the answer to it. You know it very well. What side of the Jordan River are you on? You know. Do You look around you and say, I'm satisfied exactly where I'm at. I got a little bit of the world but I'm close enough to God. Stay there long enough. You'll confuse people with your testimony. You'll expose yourself to the enemy because you're not connected fully to him 
And because you're not connected fully to him, you will not fully know his blessings. As much as fun do you think you're having, I feel bad for you because whether you realize it or not, you're the most miserable person on this earth. I say that in love. And lastly, you're affecting somebody. Either to be stirred to live their faith for God or to take it easy before the Jordan. Let's pray. Here's a wonderful opportunity to say, Lord, I want to lay a hold of all your promises. God Almighty, whatever I see with my eyes that is not a part of your will, I don't want it. I want to take what you have by faith. And I want to go where you want me to go. And I want to be exactly where you want me to be. What's so amazing is that it's never too late. It's never too late to grab a hold of hand with God. And to allow him to lead you where he wants you to be. But it's going to take humility. It's going to take honesty with our own hearts to say, I've planted myself here when God wants me to be here. Or maybe tonight, there's something that you've been facing as intimidating as Og. I'm talking about a sin issue. I want to read a verse for you, for all of us, really. It's in the book of Romans, chapter 16. Excuse me, chapter 6. Look what Paul says in verse 14. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Do you realize something? That what Paul said there wasn't a command. It's a promise. He said sin will have no dominion over you. Not don't let sin have dominion over you. That's a different command. This was a promise. That because you and I are under grace and not under law, we can enter into a place where sin has no dominion over us. Now, did Paul say, some sin will have no dominion over you? You know, like when it comes to the little things, they won't have dominion over you. But the big things, like Og, I'm sorry to give it to you. He's just too big. So you have to deal with him and share some land with him. No. No sin will have dominion over you. And what the Israelites needed to do was believe God to conquer Og. And what you and I need to do is believe God to conquer sin by faith. See, the fight of faith against sin cannot even begin if we don't believe God to help us. The fight against sin cannot even start if we don't trust that God can give us victory over it. It starts with faith. Everything comes by faith. Everything is experienced through faith. So you might have battled. You might have been through counseling sessions. You might have had 300 people lay hands on you and say, God, help this brother or sister come over sin. You're still in the fight. You're still in the fight. You have breath in your lungs. You're sitting in this chair. You're hearing the word of God. And this is God's word to you. Don't give up fighting. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Believe that no sin will have dominion over you. Keep believing that truth. Lay a hold of the promise of God. Lay a hold of the promise of God. And trust that as ugly as that giant is, it's no match for the power of God. It's no match for the power of God. Oh, there's so much more that we can say. But let's not turn whatever remaining energy we have towards the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. So many things have been said. Lord, here's my og shirt. Or Lord, I have to admit, I thought that what I saw was better than what you promised. Better than what you promised. I've taken my convenience. I've taken my desires. I've taken my issues. And I've come up with my own version of life. And I wasn't centered on your will. Let me say this one more time. 
and I'll end here. No matter how comfortable you are sitting before the Jordan and not crossing, no matter how comfortable it is, listen to me, time will come that when the enemy decides to show up, he will find yourself outside of the perfect will of God, outside of total disobedience, and he will have a greater advantage over you. And when it comes to that point, listen to me very carefully. It won't be so fun anymore. So now's the chance. Now's your chance. Eight years. Eight years I've been walking with the Lord, and I can tell you, those that have chosen to stay before the Jordan, they were having a blast in the beginning. And let me tell you, as years passed by, bondage. Captives. Outside of the protection and the favor of God. You don't want to be there. Come to the promised land. Come exactly where God wants you to be. Speak to Him.